right, we're gonna call to order our workshop. Welcome everybody. Declaration of a quorum, seven members present. Brings us to item C, hearing of citizens, anyone? We have none today. Brings us to item D1, review November 8th, 2022, election results and related timelines. Mr. Martindale. Very good, thank you, Mr. Wack. I thought I'd just take a minute just so we kind of align process timing of things and everyone was familiar with that. Uh, we will canvas the election results officially tomorrow at two o'clock. We need two board members available for that. So I know Ms. Warren's going to confirm with at least two of you for two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And we'll let the group know so that if others are not available, they don't make an unnecessary trip uh, up. But that will occur tomorrow. At our December meeting, we will uh, have all of our re newly re-elected, re-elected, our incumbents uh, uh, take oath of office again at the December meeting, and then as a board, you will go through the uh, reorg process as you do uh, after each election in November or December. So those things will be a part of our agenda in December. Uh, as far as the TRE, uh, and I did share this information with you and we communicated it with our employees, but I just wanted to review it a real uh, quick again here in workshop. On December the 9th, that is uh, the first pay uh, period in December for our employees. December the 9th will be the first check our employees receive with the additional raise that's resulting of the passage of the TRE. January the 10th, when we return uh, from the holiday break, they will get the second half of their retention stipend for those that are eligible for that. If you remember, we did the earlier, the, the first half uh, earlier this fall. That's the second half of the retention stipend for eligible employees. And on January 25th will be retro pay applied. That'll be one time, and that is relative to the passage of the TRE and retro pay to that new schedule for the months or their contract date. Uh, prior to the December 9th check. Uh, and then beginning February 10th, we should be all settled up with everyone. Uh, and that check will again look like the December 9th check. So a couple of, of different uh, pay periods that Ms. Strauss and her group are working on. And again, we've shared this information with our employees, but I just wanted to touch base with the group as well. I do want to uh, mention this, because uh, I, I, I think it's something we should be proud of. Uh, grateful for the support of our community. Uh, there were 36 TRE elections uh, held by school districts in the state of Texas on the 8th. 17 of those 36 passed, that's 47.2%. Uh, the districts with more than 2,000 votes cast are the ones that we researched were able to find. Our passage rate was 61.2%. Uh, of those others we were able to research with more than 2,000 votes cast, our passing rate was the highest. Uh, again, I think that's uh, uh, just um, indicative of the support that we have of the community. And as I told the chamber uh, board this morning, it's not something we take lightly and we're very grateful and appreciative of that. And we'll continue to work hard um, for our community. So that's what I have for agenda item one, Mr. Horak. All right, that'll bring us to item two, consideration and discussion related to the 2023-2024 school calendar development process. Mr. Martindale. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Board members, we have our executive director of secondary education, uh, Ms. Tiffany Parkerson. Ms. Parkerson is currently leading the DEIC through the calendar development process, the 23-24 calendar. I got the years messed up earlier. I just, I, I, I can't process the fact that we're working on next year's calendar. Uh, in November, uh, but uh, Tiffany is going to just take a few minutes. I think she has a brief presentation, about 10 slides, to share with you the process she's going through with that group, which ultimately will culminate and bring some uh, uh, possibilities to the board to consider around January. So, Ms. Parkerson. Good evening, Mr. Martindale, Mr. Horak, and the members of the board. Um, as Mr. Martindale noted, uh, I am going to give you a brief overview of the calendar development process as we plan forward toward the 2023-24 school year. Tiffany, check and see if your microphone's on, please.
Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't <laughs> hear it. Uh, but since I have, I'm the oldest one sitting up here, maybe everyone else can't. So I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ms. Parkinson. Thank you, Dr. Payne. <laughs> Let me gather myself together. All right, so as far as our steps in the calendar development process, um, we actually started um, back in, um, in earlier this, this year in September and October um, through developing the parameters um, and soliciting input from our stakeholders. And I'll share a little bit about what that looked like here in a moment. At our most recent meeting here um, last week, the DEIC reviewed draft calendars and provided feedback. Um, we had three calendars that we took a look at and um, members had an opportunity to provide individual feedback after visiting with their table groups and having some time for discussion around those. Um, we are taking that initial feedback on those draft calendars and I'm working right now um, on some protocols to have our members gather feedback in preparation for when we come back together again in De December in our meeting before the break where we will refine those draft calendars based on that feedback um, and then prepare for our online stakeholder feedback and voting process, which is similar to what we do every year, so that we um, allow the entire community an opportunity to take a look at draft calendars um, and let us know um, their, their thoughts and feelings regarding those, and then we refine those again um, whenever we come together as a DEIC in January. Um, and we will vote to recommend um, either one or two calendars um, for your consideration at the January meeting and usually the January um, Board of Trustees meeting is when we do approve those that calendar option for the following school year, allowing our families and students and teachers plenty of time um, to plan forward toward the following school year. So as far as um, looking at that, that stakeholder feedback, um, the DEIC is made up of community members uh, as well as parents and then of course um, primarily educators who represent all the different campuses. And so we wanted to make sure that as we were framing up this conversation that we didn't um, stay so focused on our own individual perspectives um, that we forgot about others. And so we spent some time really thinking about what is important in it for students in a calendar, um, what is important for our families, um, for the educators um, ourselves, as well as um, the context around our community at large, um, especially in partnership with the university and the other big events that happen in our community. Um, so we took a, a large amount of feedback from, um, from all of the members of, of DEIC, uh, gathered that based on those four key stakeholder groups, um, and then I cross-referenced it looking for patterns across the groups and identified that um, into these key priorities um, created from all of that feedback. And so if you'll look, it is quite a long list of priorities from the DEIC. And so we also are, are very cognizant um, that it's very difficult within the time constraints that we have to fully achieve or fully maximize um, each of these priorities and there's give and take throughout the process. And we've had really great conversations um, on those initial calendars, looking at them through the, each of these lenses and checking them off. So these are really our criteria we keep coming back to. So first of all, um, first and foremost, student needs such as childcare, safety, um, concerns about food insecurity, um, and as well as maximizing the time we have with them for learning is first and foremost. And so I would say out of all of these, this is um, in priority order. All the rest of these bullets could be interchangeable, um, if you will. We also noted um, the importance of trying to have intermittent breaks both for students, as past calendars have, but also prioritizing that staff get to have some breaks in there as well beyond staff development. And then really looking at the length of our Thanksgiving and winter break lengths and making sure that they accommodate um, our families where, where students might need to go to two different households during the break, um, for example, or um, families that need to, to fly across the world. Um, and even for our families that just wanna get to, to take a trip with one another. So to make sure that we are maximizing the time that we have available within those breaks um, for all of those different um, factors. Additionally, um, we identified easing into the school year with a two to three day week with students um, would be ideal if we were able to do so. It gets everybody used to procedures and routines. Um, I think about my own um, first grader um, who still hasn't made it past about um, 6.30 p.m. after the first day of school. And so we know our littles especially need that time to transition and get used to coming to school. Um, we also are cognizant that grading period links need to um, consider timing and pacing of course materials, um, as well as the timing of final exams um, 
for, for years now, we've really um, prioritized finishing the semester before winter break and making sure those final exams finish there. Additionally, um, graduation um, needs to happen before the end of May based on the feedback as well um, for a variety of reasons. Um, additionally, that time for professional learning, collaboration, and planning for our educators is incredibly important. Um, and then always um, in the back of our mind, we do have those connections to Texas A&M University and Blinn College and making sure that our major breaks, such as spring break, for example, are aligned with the university um, and college to the best we can. So um, I did share three really rough draft calendars. Um, this last week um, and they were able to provide feedback. I'm not sharing those calendars tonight because um, they are going to be um, revised probably even starting tomorrow again um, before we get that stakeholder feedback. Um, so I will share with you via transmittal the revised versions of them and the instructions that I'm giving the, the campuses for their informal feedback gathering before we do our, our large survey. Um, there is one calendar, uh, just so you're aware, that is very similar to the current school year's calendar um, and the other ones um, are are slightly different, try a couple of different things within them. All right, so this is where we are. Um, I will be giving some protocols to our members for them to gather feedback. Once again, in December, I'll give you a quick update as to where we are um, with the calendars that the DIC is narrowing in on, and ultimately our goal is to have a recommendation ready for that January board meeting. Um, and really the next major step is that our representatives will have an opportunity to take some of these examples back to their campuses um, and, and post them and let folks see them and give some initial feedback before we have our more formalized survey that will go out as well. So that's our brief overview of uh, the DIC calendar development process and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Hey, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Parkinson, I have a question. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, who's on DEIC? Which board member representatives? Uh, Mr. Hall. Mr. Mr. Hall and Ben. John. Mr. Ben. I don't recall you being president at the last DEIC was, meeting. You're absolutely correct. I was at my daughter's signing. I, I just wanted a reflection on the activities Ms. Parkinson took y'all through as a DEIC. No, okay, I'm just checking. I know there is great appreciation would, would you for like the interactive speak? nature of my meetings. I would say Ms. Parkinson does a wonderful job. <laughs> Thank indeed, you, Ms. Parkinson. Indeed. All right, we're gonna move to number three. And, yep. Dr. <laughs> and, and Dr. Perry did a great superintendent update. It was very concise <laughs> and to the point. No elaboration. So we're gonna move to number three. Appreciate it, Mr. Hall, for your feedback there. You'll have more time during the board meeting. Received demographers report on student growth and enrollment projections, Mr. Martindale. Thank you, Ms. Sorak. What a, what a yeah, feisty group this team. Uh, Hunter Huff is joining us from Zonda uh, Demographers. He's probably wondering uh, about us as he's uh, watched us interact oh, through the first great. couple this of- This is great. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this so, uh, no, Hunter's here to provide us our fall update uh, projections with regards to enrollment. Again, this process, Hunter will take us through their 10-year projections so we can kind of see the, the, the projected growth as a district through the eight years, apply that to, uh, you'll be able to see that at the campus level as well. Remember, this is the first step. Then next month, Ms. Strauss will take FC Local, take the information that Hunter shares with us tonight in our update and kind of apply uh, capacity numbers, you'll see some of that with Hunter's work. Uh, also, the comparability uh, parts uh, as a de a defined by FC Local. So all the extra pieces that we're accustomed to with FC <coughs> Local will occur at the December meeting and any particular recommendations, suggestions, or thoughts for exploration will be a part of administration's recommendation in December. Uh, when we do the FC local. So this is the first step. They give us the numbers, the demographers, and then we'll do some work with it and come back to you in December. So with that said, Hunter, All right. thank you for we're, being here. Well, President, uh, uh, Rory, thank you so much. Uh, board members and, and uh, Mr. Martindale, thank you for the opportunity to, to be with you today. It's great to be in back in College Station. It's been a while for me, but I'm excited to be back. Uh, quick review. Uh, 
can. Let's see if I can get that working. Uh, a quick review of our current enrollment uh, grade numbers in comparison to our last few years. Uh, first, I will point out that uh, we show you have grown about 283 students. That's a growth rate of about 2% from the previous school year. Uh, and I would also point out that uh, you can see in this, uh, there's a reference to uh, the yellow uh, cells having the largest uh, uh, grade class and the green being the second large grade class. And you can see uh, that there was a fifth grade class that's back in 2018. And uh, it moved, it has moved up year over year and that uh, class is actually in the ninth grade now. And so uh, you, you can see that, and we always want to point that out, that at some point in time, as that class continues to move forward uh, into their later years in, in high school, that there could be a little bit of a leveling off uh, as we continue to manage the growth in, in that time frame. But just important to note that. Uh, and then you can see below that there are the grade cohorts. And so in reference to that, you can see an increase in the first and seventh grade levels uh, that had significant uh, growth year, uh, year over year. Our economy related to our job market has been extremely strong in the last several years. Uh, that has contributed to a strong housing market. Uh, unemployment in Texas as of August uh, was at 4.2% and the College Station Bryan area was at 3.5%. Uh, we anticipate that there will continue to uh, be con uh, significant job growth. Uh, you can see that here at CC Creations, uh, which is uh, scheduled to bring several uh, hundred new jobs, uh, as well as the uh, Fuji uh, facility that is expected to create 150 uh, new jobs and then there's an expansion of GCON that, is, uh, that we show is going to add about an additional 100 to 150 new jobs. You can see by the, uh, the rise of the uh, home prices, uh, the average home prices, that there has been significant cost, the rise in, in those numbers as well. Uh, you can see that there's about a 58% increase uh, over the last 10 years in new homes. And, uh, it's about a 61% increase uh, with your existing, uh, within existing home sales. So with that said, you can see this next slide, there has actually been uh, a drop in home sales in the district. And this is not necessarily specific to College Station. This is happening throughout the state and, 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 and right now probably throughout the country as, uh, as interest rates have increased uh, with the Federal Reserve uh, raising the federal fund uh, rate over the last several months. Um, the example like we, we've been sharing with folks is in March, uh, there was uh, most, most um, rates were about three and a half percent and home price on average and it's consistent with what we have here in College Station would be about a $343,000 house in that time frame would be a one a, a house payment a monthly house payment of about $1,900 um, when you fast forward with price escalations in the market um, that $343,000 house has moved up to about a $365,000 house and you take that in combination with a 7% interest rate uh, that adds that monthly payment to about $2,765. So about an $800 difference over the last six to seven months. So those are the things that are challenging the, the a home buyer thinking about what they're, what they're doing right now. So we see that currently right now in quite a few markets. Um, Related to affordability, you can uh, see that multifamily, those rates uh, here in this area, um, we continue to see uh, percentage increases uh, in the multifamily uh, market as well. So you can see year over year uh, increases of that 9% and 8.8%. 8 so just throughout, uh, throughout the market, there have been increases. There are a total of about 1,161 multifamily units that are nearing completion. Uh, the large multifamily development uh, that we have here, there's, there's about 648 future multifamily units uh, that are in the planning stages. Uh, as we get uh, more into the housing development, 
let's see, we'll go, I'm sorry, I jumped forward there a little bit, I apologize for that. We're gonna get into the Southern Point. Uh, and so Southern Point that is in the Pebble Creek attendance zone, uh, there is uh, 1,994 total lots with 94 vacant developed lots in that area. Uh, in that development, 30 homes are currently under construction and 1,664 future lots are in that development. The homes are priced at about $270,000. Next, we have Pebble Creek that has about 1,800 homes uh, or lots uh, with 57 vacant developed lots and 327 future lots. We show that uh, we have, there have been uh, about eight new homes that have been permitted in this area over the last uh, six months. So I'll point out in a couple of these locations where the, the permit numbers are a little bit down over the last six months. So that's somewhat in alignment with what we're seeing with the home sales. Let's see, these, uh, these are in that 200,000 uh, range as well. Uh, next, we have uh, Brewster Point, um, and I, I would uh, reference Brewster Point um, is uh, in the Spring Creek uh, Elementary Zone, uh, and it has 197 total lots, uh, three vacant developed lots, and 188 futures. And the, uh, the, they final platted uh, phase three for 88 additional lots uh, back in July. And uh, we anticipate build out uh, right now in about mid-2024. Uh, Next, we have uh, Creek Meadows that is about 1,005 total lots. Approximately 885 of those homes uh, are built and occupied, uh, but they do have 120 vacant developed lots remaining. Uh, this also has a development that has only uh, permitted about eight homes in the last, month, the last six months. So again, uh, a little bit of a slowdown in that area. There is also Green Prairie uh, Reserve that has 906 total lots with 63 vacant developed lots uh, in 780 uh, future lots. These, uh, they're anticipating right now about 60, uh, 40 to 60 homes that would be built per year. And these are in that 350,000 uh, price range. Next, a uh, future development that's, that's coming is, is Wellburn Settlement, has 115 future lots. Uh, and there is groundwork and utilities that are underway. Uh, and they do anticipate the first few homes being delivered uh, by the end of 2023. There is Winding Creek Estates that has 25 vacant developed lots and 23 futures uh, that are planned. Let's see. These are uh, in that 530 plus uh, range, so we'll, we'll definitely be slower, slower uh, developing in that area. Finally, we have uh, Midtown Reserve that has 724 total lots uh, with 33 uh, vacant developed lots in there and 60 homes that are currently under construction. Uh, and we know that we have about 409 future lots that are in that development. And they've permitted 17 new homes in the last six months, estimating about 120, when things ramp back up, 100 to 120 homes uh, uh, being built every year. And this is a DR Horton development. And then we do have uh, Midtown Reserve. Uh, let's see, is that 724 uh, total lots with 33 vacant developed lots, 60 homes underneath there. That's, and I actually jumped around there. I apologize for that. I missed, I, I think I jumped, jumped over that one very quick. Did I? Mission Ranch. Go back. Yeah, I apologize for that. Mission Ranch has the 123 <coughs> vacant developed lots and 237 future lots. Uh, the platted, uh, they have uh, platted several of the phases over the last several months, uh, and they uh, anticipate building out that over the next five years. Uh, and the price range of that is, is that uh, 350,000 plus.
Our research team has uh, reported that the international leadership of Texas will be building and opening up a high school uh, grade building uh, behind the current K through eight campus. And that building is anticipated to be built this next year and opened in August of 2024. Our kindergarten numbers are down from the previous year, but that is uh, relative to uh, relatively in line with the birth rate birth rates uh, that were dated back to 2017. So the, the previous 2016 year, uh, we had a, a few more kindergarten numbers uh, last year, uh, but you can also see that there were there were more uh, births in that uh, correlated uh, 2016 year. So we think that's somewhat uh, tied to that. Specific to grade levels, this this goes back and identifies uh, your your uh, larger grade classes. But I would uh, reference the tables to the right to show. Uh, where the numbers are related to growth and uh, the total percentage of growth. And so you can see that we are uh, dropping the projections for next year a little bit down to that 1.6, uh, proposing to be a little bit more conservative with seeing what we're seeing with, with the uh, building permit numbers and the home starts uh, slowing a bit with the uh, interest, uh, uh, interest rate increases. Uh, but we still anticipate that as time goes on, the market will settle settle that out, uh, potentially prices may come down a little bit to offset and make sure that there's affordability in the market um, to offset those higher interest rates. So we do anticipate that things will continue to move forward and uh, homes are gonna continue to be built and people are gonna continue to be moving into this area. Hunter, I have a quick question before you move yes. on. What, what are you seeing as you guys do these for various districts throughout the, the state? What, what are you seeing just collectively in general from the state? I know some spots are probably still have, are experiencing significant growth, but others are dropping off. I mean, is there, or did I just capture it? What's the, what's the theme? It, it, it is, we, we are seeing a slowing in growth. And in, 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 in Texas, uh, we still continue to see, there's, there's job growth, there's still growth that's happening but we have seen a slow, a slowing in uh, home construction over the last several, several months. Um, and so we are seeing those things slow down. We are also seeing a little bit of the elementary numbers dropping a little bit, especially in the kindergarten, first grade levels. We're trying to figure out if that's related to um, the birth rates dropping. We know that the birth rates in general have dropped uh, for, for, for a number of years. And so we, we know that's a contributor. Uh, and then we, we know that there's a, a possibility that there over the last few years um, with some of the things that have happened, uh, that there may be a, a few folks that are keeping their kids home uh, in those earlier grades. And so that's helping, or that's, that's dropping some of the overall numbers, but we still see our secondary and our high school numbers continue to, to stay stable. So it's in those lower grade levels that we're seeing some drops. Overall, when you look at it on a uh, campus by campus basis, uh, you can see that the capacities are still uh, well in line with where you need them to be for the next uh, several years at the elementary level. Uh, so from that standpoint, that, that's, that's a good thing to be able to, to, to be in, a, in that kind of a position. Uh, we do anticipate with the growth and development that's in the Pebble Creek uh, attendance areas that by the 26-27 year that those are going to to reach beyond capacity and so some decisions may have to be made and then again long term uh, maybe Southwood Valley Elementary may may uh, reach capacity and have some challenges moving forward in those out years so if you can go back so in the boards aware of course Pebble Creek that's the southern point development that he referenced earlier um, <clears throat> and when it highlights on here, and again, Amy will go into more detail next month, the highlight with theirs, they're using the same capacity numbers we utilize and that we will use in our FC local presentation. Uh, but the highlight begins at 110% capacity number that we've identified in policy. So Pebble Creek, as you're aware, is Southern Point. Southwood Valley would be um, because of, of uh, development of Midtown. Middle school capacities, there's still uh, room. You uh, 
have uh, strong numbers at both A&M Consolidated and Wilburn uh, and uh, some lower numbers at College Station Middle, uh, but all well within capacity numbers uh, up until that 28, 29 year uh, for Wilburn. Uh, so, and then uh, really the, the challenge that's there uh, is, is something I don't know the district is aware of is, is College Station High School uh, specific to, to where you're at with capacity. Uh, and that, that, that's only going to, those numbers are only increasing in that, uh, for, for that high school specifically. To summarize, uh, College Station economic and housing uh, market continues to, to experience growth. Uh, we do anticipate that home sales will be in that, more than 2,000 home sales over, uh, over the 2022 year. Uh, 760 lots that are available to build on and uh, a significant number of lots, a specific 3,800 planned future lots still to come. Uh, need to be aware uh, that, that there is an expansion of the international leadership of Texas uh, uh, campus and uh, but we see significant continued growth and anticipate that the enrollment will uh, exceed 15,400 by the time we get to 27, 28, and ultimately about 16,400 by the time uh, we're in 32, 33, just a few years from now. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Hopefully an easy one. On the IL Texas build of the high school, are you factoring us in any change to our numbers based on that? We, we don't have any major adjustments to those projected numbers right now. Uh, we know that they currently have uh, high school students that are currently at the K, K through eight uh, levels and would anticipate that much of their growth would probably just be a carry up from their prior, uh, our prior student grades, but that will be something that we will continue to talk to the district about uh, this next year moving moving into next to the to the following to make sure that we're prepared for uh, planning as far as 2024 because they do have the heights have a high school open in town they just don't have their own facility they're leasing the space so i wouldn't expect it to necessarily be any we, any we, change in numbers we haven't really. referenced any 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 oh, okay. change in the projections at this point in time because of that yeah typically those it is their capacity is because they just carry the kids up mm -hmm. right so Amy, at the end of last year, we were projected at 2.6, so this one's been adjusted to 2.0, correct? Am I remembering correctly as to our spring update was 2.6? Yes, it's 2.6, and, and I will remind you, when I was presenting enrollment, um, I even had it higher, but I go from snapshot date, and his data is as of the, from the end of last year to now, so... Uh, I like to use those stable numbers at TEA reports. So uh, mine was as of snapshot date. So, but it's, it's still relative uh, to that same difference. Okay. And we will, of course, if you have any additional questions for Hunter, but we'll we'll dig into this uh, even more next month as Amy kind of presents it and, and applies local policy and then for questions. So we dig into that more next month, then we'll absolutely have the opportunity to talk about it. Very good. Anything else? We appreciate you presenting for us. Thank, Hunter, you, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Yep. That'll bring us to item four. Receive a report regarding mid-year progress on the CSISD strategic plan. Mr. Martindale. Thank you, Mr. Wack, board members. Also at the DEIC meeting, uh, Last week, I know that uh, they were provided kind of a, a brief uh, mid-year um, update as far as progress on our strategic plan. So we have Dr. Hickman, Ms. Parkinson, and Dr. Perry is going to tag team this and kind of review the six goals and the specific results we identified for this year, again, year two of our strategic plan and just kind of give us an overview and an update as to where we are currently. We're saying mid-year, but I need to remind you it's November. So you're going to see some items that have moved along fairly well with and some that we have not accomplished much of anything with at this point in time, but we're still kind of early in the year. 
but uh, just an update to the board, low progress monitoring we thought would be uh, a, a good presentation and conversation. So with that, I'll turn things over. I think Ms. Parkerson, you're uh, kicking things off for us, correct? Yes, sir. Good evening once again. Um, we're excited to share the great work that we have accomplished this year so far regarding our uh, strategic plan. Um, within CSISD. And just as a quick reminder, um, the strategic design framework was created by a large committee in the spring of 2021, um, in addition to revising our vision and some of our uh, portraits of learners and so forth. Um, this team also created our strategic goals. And these six goals really are the, the backbone of this work. Um, these are lofty and aspirational goals that will take us multiple years to achieve. Um, we are looking toward the next three to five years, um, and, and many of these will need to continue um, after that even uh, to be fully maximized. So I want us to keep that in mind um, whenever we're looking at these goals, that we are not seeking to achieve all of this work this year, but we will make great strides toward that. I'd also like to remind everyone that our strategic plan is our district improvement plan. Um, as you see that the formatting of that district improvement plan, we begin with that goal um, in mind, as well as the specific results that were also framed by that initial design team. Um, and those specific results are things that, that need to happen in order for us to be able to um, achieve our, our overarching larger goals. Um, what we want to accomplish this year are really listed there in, um, in white, in those strate strategies and action steps. And so that's really what we're after this year. And I had shared previously with you all uh, via transmittal, the document as it is formatted in this way. And so um, we're not going to, to read through the plan itself to you this after, or this evening, um, however. Um, we also, as Mr. Martinell noted, um, gave the November um, District Improvement Plan Progress Monitoring check-in at our last DIC meeting um, just last week. As we go through each of these action steps for this year um, and highlight some of those key things, you'll notice that we use uh, these same monitoring symbols throughout. Um, it is only November. We do not have green check marks, nor should we, um, if we, um, it would indicate that we had not uh, set our, our uh, eyes high enough on the prize, if you will. Um, and so we will see um, mostly um, some progress. There are a couple of areas where we do not have any progress and we have um, reasons why and we can tell you what work is on the horizon in those areas as we work our way through as well. So with all of that, um, this is our project for year one. So goal one is focused on enhancing those effective instructional practices by implementing innovative and personalized learning experiences for our students um, and also for our educators. So with our first specific result, we are really focusing in on addressing distinct learning needs, interests, aspirations, and cultural backgrounds of all learners. And as you can see, we've made some progress. Um, I would even argue significant progress in this area. Um, the, the action steps here are really focused um, in on our, our campuses um, and the work that they are doing around the framework for success. And I will highlight a few of those activities here in a moment as well. <laughs> For specific results 1.2, we're looking at creating a system of personalized uh, learning for all educators. Um, and that is not something um, that, that can happen overnight. We're taking those first steps toward being able to do that through our action step this year. Um, this is one of the specific results that we brought forward for this year that was not something that we worked on last year that I wanted, wanted to point that out as well. Um, a lot of our work in this area really is about um, getting the infrastructure, if you will, the systems behind the scene, such as building the professional learning system within PowerSchool, um, looking for ways we can support our teachers in their individual um, T-test goals, um, and then um, working with our principals within the leadership definition as well. And our third uh, specific result in this goal area is individualized goal setting and progress monitoring for our students. But we are unable to achieve that specific result um, until we have a great understanding across our campus administration of what data we have and what we're able to do with it. And so that's really our starting point um, in the work in that area as well. So here are some highlights of the great work that has happened so far. As I mentioned, um, specific results 1.1 is really about what our campuses are doing and implementing the framework for success. The framework for success is not just that um, brightly colored logo. Each of these comes with um, educator and learner protocols and are linked with instructional best practices to help us better serve our students. And so each of our uh, 19 campuses has identified one of these phases to really focus in on this year. Um, 
and they are integrating this into their focus in a variety of ways. And so here are just a few examples um, from our campuses. At Spring Creek Elementary, they're focusing on uh, Inspire, um, and they're using that weekly newsletter for different members of their faculty to share um, why they are inspired, how they inspire others, um, moments of inspiration from the, the, their weeks. And so that is an example um, of that. Um, Cypress Grove is doing some work really in uh, personalizing professional learning by having um, choice book clubs for their professional learning community work. And so that's represented there um, at the top of the slideshow. Um, whereas uh, Welburn Middle School is also working on Engage, and you can see how they're focusing really on that best practice underneath that uh, piece of the framework for success of standards alignment and really making sure that all of our learning that is happening in our classroom matches the depth and complexity at which the standards are supposed to be taught. And so, like I said, just a sampling, um, but it represents the wide array of things that are happening on our campuses related to their framework for success implementation. Um, additional highlights in this area, going back to that personalized professional learning, um, really uh, Mr. Mann has made great strides in working on the PowerSchool professional learning system. This is the software where we are able to track our professional learning, um, set up our courses, uh, eventually we'll be able to, um, to use it for um, creating and housing different um, self-paced modules, linking things in from Schoology that are created there and so forth. And so really it's an important piece for us to be able to move the work forward. Um, additionally, um, throughout our district and our campus professional development, we provide choices. I'll give an example. Um, in, so, in social studies recently, uh, Ms. Rodriguez um, had a, a share fair type environment where various teachers signed up and shared their own expertise and um, the other teachers in the audience got to pick what they went to. And so personalizing learning can be just that simple, having options available. Um, additionally, we are really working on leveraging our new leadership definition through our work and our individual goal setting and coaching with our principals. And so really, they're getting that firsthand experience and what that personalized uh, learning looks like for them through our principal collaboratives that we have, as well as their own one-on-one -on -one time um, with Stormy and myself as we work with them on their goals. Um, and then finally in this area, we have a lot of information and we are really excited that it is um, now housed under one umbrella in a tool called Performance Matters. And so if you see the, um, the picture here in the bottom right, that is a picture of the baseball card report. And just like the back of a baseball card, we can look at a lot of data sets for one student all in one place, ranging from star scores to absences to six weeks grades. Um, and so it's a really powerful tool to take um, data sets from a lot of different places and look at them side by side and really hone in on a, a student's needs. And so we at this point have done um, all of our train the trainers sessions. Um, all of our teachers um, are in, in the process of, um, if not already trained on accessing the robust reports and data available here within that system. Um, our next steps here will then be to really work with our principals on streamlining our data analysis processes and how we're using this information that we have. Um, and then additionally, um, that specific result, 1.3, is about individual student goal setting. And so while um, as a district as a whole, we are not um, moving forward <laughs> and making sure all 19 campuses have these going, our baseline is really using the data first. I did want to acknowledge that we do have some campuses who are uh, innovators and early adopters who are really working with students on setting their own learning goals and helping kids track their own learning. And it's really exciting work to see that. What grade level are those? I'm just curious. So Where really a lot of our, our elementaries um, in our and some of our intermediates primarily. Um, and really they're using a lot of the great reporting that we see from NWA MAP and using that tool to really look at a certain area within it and the, the zones of proximal development and what is the just right next step for those students and helping them take ownership. Okay. All right, I'm gonna take over for goal two. Let's see if I can. All right, so uh, goal two is that CSISD will elevate the outcomes for our historically underperforming student groups. So the first uh, specific result that we're gonna look at under goal two is increasing student success by establishing a calibrated comprehensive MTSS program. So MTSS stands for Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. Uh, it's 
previously known as RTI, or Response to Intervention. The purpose of MTSS is really so that we identify gaps with students and we provide intervention that's targeted before we see those gaps widen. So it really is about um, identifying what we need to do so that our students don't get behind to begin with, and that if we have students who are behind, what we can do to get them caught up as quickly as possible. So you'll see we've got some progress noted uh, on all of the items here for this specific results. We're working together to revise our handbooks associated with MTSS to make sure that those are uh, calibrated across campuses and that they're being used, uh, it, that they're reflective of the work that is being done on our campuses. The next specific result is increasing student achievement by implementing research-based best practices in tier one instruction. So tier one instruction is that differentiated everyday instruction that happens in the classroom. All of our students receive tier one instruction every single day. And so our goal here is really just to continue improving upon the, the best practices that our teachers are using in their classrooms every single day. You can see uh, there are a couple of these items where we've noted some progress because um, really what Tiffany just spoke about, that implementation of the framework of success uh, and our content coordinators working toward visioning documents for each of our content areas. Uh, we also have a couple of upcoming projects that are noted on here as well. Uh, we will be working toward creating a curriculum management plan which will encompass uh, everything to do with curriculum and really be great about defining roles and responsibilities uh, as it comes to implementing our curriculum. And then also allowing professional learning uh, community protocols along with that, so that not only do we have uh, our framework for uh, our framework for success and in our instructional best practices, but we also have protocols and frameworks in place to implement those uh, on campuses. A few highlights of goal two. So I mentioned that we've been working on our MTSS handbooks. Currently we have an elementary and a secondary MTSS handbook that were developed last year. So we have uh, called together stakeholders from each one of the campuses uh, to get their feedback on what's working, what's not working, what might we need to adjust or clarify in order to make that really a, the really be useful documents for our teachers on campuses. Uh, and then we also have really begun that work, and, and it is continual work in the school district, uh, of improving those tier one instructional practices. Uh, many of our campuses have designated professional learning communities during the school day, so that their teachers have an opportunity to get together and really talk about instruction and data and what it is that needs to be happening in our classrooms specific to their classroom and their campus so that they're uh, working to help their kids succeed. Uh, those data discussions have been quite targeted, especially with that addition of performance matters, which Tiffany just spoke about. Uh, and then I also want to highlight just planning for small group instruction. When we talk about instructional best practices, many of our campuses selected small group instruction as the best practice that they wanted to focus on this year. And so while we have traditionally had small group instruction in our elementary campuses, we have definitely seen that move into our intermediate level and even into our middle school level this year. So uh, we are really moving forward toward that idea of making sure every single student gets what they need instructionally and knowing that small group is one way, one thing that we can leverage in order to make sure all students are supported. All right, goal three is <coughs> focusing on enriching students' school experiences by strengthening relationships between students, staff, and families. And so with specific result 3.1, we're focusing on training and ongoing support for staff in promoting positive relationships, um, which begins by determining what support is needed in this area. Um, and then based on those needs, exploring and identifying potential training opportunities for promoting those positive relationships. Um, and really, Mrs. Hester and the counselors have, uh, have taken the lead in this area, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about their work here in a moment. Um, for specific result 3.3, um, we're also wanting to promote an engaging relationship between the school district and the outside community. Um, this really um, 
is asking our campuses to take action to um, go out and engage stakeholders off campus in a different setting. Um, and also um, by participating in community service and allowing our students an opportunity to give back to the greater community at large, um, as well as making sure that we are sharing these community outreach activities and service projects um, through social media and other channels to make sure that people are aware that these things are happening. So as far as the highlights of our progress so far, um, as I mentioned, Ms. Hester and the counselors are creating flexible training options, um, not only for our educators, but also to have available for families in ways that they can support their students um, in recognizing and some of the, the issues of the day, um, such as um, dealing with stress um, and anxiety and peer pressure and, and those types of things. Um, and so that is in the works. In addition, um, we have a plethora of events and, and always have where we welcome um, folks to our school community, such as our fall, fall carnival uh, events on campuses. Um, but really this goal is about expanding that um, to, to going out and pushing into the community. Um, so for example, our early childhood um, programs all came together um, at College Station High School to hold their second annual early childhood multicultural night. And, and in that time, um, the participation grew exponentially. It was a huge event, um, very well attended and very well celebrated um, by our, our families in the early childhood programs here. Um, additionally, um, Riverbend here is hosting an event geared toward families um, and, and really helping them understand how they can support their students as learners, um, both academically and socially and emotionally. Um, and then just today, um, Consol uh, had their Consol Cares event where 250 of our high school students actually left the building today and went throughout our community, um, serving in places from Scotty's house to, um, to other elementary schools um, and so forth to really um, have that opportunity to, to understand what service is and how they can, um, can benefit others. Um, and so it's really exciting. I was just looking at some pictures before the workshop began. So I would uh, encourage you to check social media and we'll be sharing some of those via Transmittal um, this week as well, highlighting that awesome event that happened today. So that's my kid, one of my kiddos did that today. And um, she loved it and she has a new appreciation for, she went to elementary school and she has a new appreciation for um, pre-K teachers, yeah. like huge. Yes, indeed, and, and I, you know, the, the impetus behind all of this is to have a new appreciation for all the different facets of our community and to be exposed to different things that they may not have otherwise, so that's right. awesome. She loved it. Okay, um, goal four um, is about focusing on cultivating and strengthening intentional partnerships with businesses, community organizations, and higher education agencies. Um, and so in this area, um, we have made, made some progress, and this is um, one of those goals where we have um, plans to, to really focus our work now that the TRE has passed um, and to move forward on this, um, on this work. So we do have um, a lot of existing community partnerships. Um, so at this point, we have a really nice draft list of, of what we are aware of. Um, and I'm kind of jumping to the highlights, so I'll move to the next thing. Um, as well as for 4.2, um, the specific results about identifying needs of various groups within CSISD, that's our next step. We have we have the draft, as I said. We, we know what we, um, what we from our centralized location understand um, that we have, but we wanna first start with surveying our campuses um, to get a little bit more input to make sure that we know all of the partnerships that, that they have as well. Um, also to identify their needs uh, for, for future partnerships. Um, and then reach out to our community organizations to see how we can help them and benefit them as well. And so, um, so Chuck is really uh, taking the lead in this area and working on these things as we move forward. We're also um, exploring a lot of future opportunities. Uh, just last night at the Chamber of Commerce banquet, uh, Dr. Banks talked about um, Texas A&M University's desire to have a, a stronger community connection and partnership. Um, and we are really excited about some, um, some additional conversations that we have been able to have that we're not really ready to, to share publicly, um, but they go above and beyond even the things that you are seeing here um, on the screen. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't point these awesome opportunities that 
exist already. Uh, Mr. Mann has been working with the Texas A&M School of Education for professional learning opportunities. Um, the top class courses that are featured there are focused on leadership development and we're using those for, for the assistance in personalizing our learning for our principals and our assistant principals. They also have Project Moople, which is really geared at teachers improving their practice. And so um, that's an exciting opportunity. Um, every year we partner with the other um, high schools in our community, um, Brian ISD and so forth for Braz Brazos Valley College and Career Night. Um, and so that is an exciting way for our, our students to see their futures and plan forward. Additionally, as you know, um, we expanded the programs at College View High School um, with, within the academy system. Two of those brand new partnerships are featured here. The Texas A&M Hotel and Conference Center partnership for our students um, who are in our uh, hospitality program. Um, more than half of them are employed by the hotel. I believe I shared that previously. I learned last week that two of them are, are already up for being a manager. Um, additionally, we do have students attending classes out at the Blinn College Rellis campus in our facilities engineering technology program where they're getting to have those hands-on experiences um, there as well. Okay. Amanda. All right. So thanks to the support of our College Station ISD voters in the uh, bond <laughs> propositions of November 2021, we've made really very significant progress in a lot of areas uh, within Goal 5 to improve our, our te technology ecosystem, uh, both by increasing access to devices with our, our staff and our students, uh, as well as strengthening the infrastructure and improving uh, that safe and secure digital learning environment. So looking at goal five, uh, specific result 5.1 really focuses on increasing devices in the classroom. And that was really the intent of Proposition B uh, in that November 21 bond. Uh, with the passage of over four and a half million dollars, uh, we have been able to uh, expend already about 70% of that on both teacher and student devices. Uh, that equates to about 2,800 additional laptops for our students in our classrooms, uh, as well as transitioning from desktops for the first time to all of our teachers having a laptop. And uh, we are almost um, complete on that deployment. Uh, we're doing that concurrent uh, with the upgraded uh, smart panels that are happening across our campuses. We just have a, a couple more to go and then we'll finish up uh, this summer with Southwood Valley uh, once we complete those renovations in the additional classrooms there. So. Uh, lots more devices, and uh, we'll continue uh, to purchase those and expend those uh, funds. You might notice that that multi-year purchase plan uh, notes some progress, and that's because we've really focused these first efforts on um, creating a, a system where we have one device uh, for every two students. and getting to a point where that is really equitable across our campuses. Our next steps will be to really look towards the future. Uh, we had relied on 2015 bonds uh, primarily uh, previous to this bond, and so uh, this has been uh, very, very helpful in getting us uh, back where we need to be or, or further towards it. 5.2 uh, really focuses on the infrastructure, the things that you don't necessarily see inside of the classroom, but uh, make those devices work, right? Having the, the Wi-Fi available, making sure that we have the network area storage, and those uh, funds were coming from Proposition A that included uh, about $12.3 million for uh, the things uh, that I mentioned here, as well as those uh, smart panels. Uh, we've expended about half of those dollars already, uh, and uh, included in that are an upgraded firewall and filter. Uh, we are working on upgrading our network switches, our servers at the campus level, as well as increasing our uh, storage area network. Uh, we have ordered um, many, many additional Wi-Fi access points so that we can increase uh, that availability of Wi-Fi as we uh, put more demand on that system with the increase in devices. Unfortunately, supply chain is holding us up on that one uh, a little bit, but we are expecting those to be in uh, by the end of the school year. Also, uh, not mentioned here, but will uh, be included in this component uh, is upgrades to our AV systems. 
The third specific result within goal five that we're focusing on this year is really about safety and security. Uh, we know that uh, school districts are increasingly uh, becoming uh, rich targets, not only uh, because of the financial information that we have, but also the staff and student data that we hold. And so uh, it is very, very important to us that we're doing everything we can uh, to improve not only our uh, hardening of the target uh, from that firewall wall and filtering standpoint that I mentioned already, but also human behavior. And uh, we do require annual training uh, for cybersecurity, but we also uh, in this last year have engaged a third party cybersecurity expert to help us uh, with improving student behavior um, and sorry, staff behavior when it comes to, um, to recognizing things that um, are risky. And so we actually do conduct um, monthly phishing tests of about 20% of our employees. Uh, if they click the email that they shouldn't be clicking, they get immediate feedback about why they should not have clicked it and what could have happened as a result. And uh, if they click it, then they automatically get retested the next month. And so uh, that we have noticed uh, is really showing some, some improvements as well. And I know I'm not privy to say whether Mr. Martindale has clicked the email. And with that, uh, some highlights from goal five I mentioned um, the two propositions uh, that we are uh, working from to be able to fund all of the improvements that I've mentioned with infrastructure uh, replacements as well as upgrades um, to the network and the firewall and filtering. Uh, those audio visual equipments are coming. Uh, the smart panels are very close to being uh, complete uh, and those Wi-Fi improvements are, are on the horizon as well. Uh, the, the devices um, are, are flowing in and we'll continue continue to be purchasing uh, specifically uh, some iPads and upgrading some of our labs. Uh, the 854 uh, is the number of smart panels that we have, uh, have ordered and are installing. Uh, and then you can see the information there about the student and teacher laptops as well. Back to me. All right, I am gonna to talk to you about goal six. This is the final goal uh, for us to talk about tonight. And it is about transforming learners' experiences through integrating instructional technology so that it augments the teaching and learning process. I think our, our key word in goal six is integration. Okay, so it's taking uh, the, the, all the hardware and equipment that Molly just spoke about in goal five and making sure that it has an instructional impact. Our first specific result is establishing and utilizing a comprehensive instructional technology plan for teachers and staff. Uh, the, the real focus for us this year on that is to go in and observe and see how technology is being used in our classrooms. We use something called the SAMR model. It stands for Substitution, Augmentation, Modification, and Redefinition. Kind of a mouthful, so we'll stick with SAMR. Uh, we, initially started with our digital learning coordinator last year going into classrooms with principals just to look through the lens of that model to see how technology was being integrated into lessons. Uh, we actually, in our work last year with our principals where we revamped our walkthrough form, included SAMR as part of that form. So each time a principal or assistant principal goes into a classroom, they are um, looking just to see what our level of integration is for technology so that we can have that information to know what our next steps will be to go forward. Our next specific result is implementing, creating, and did you have a question? I felt it coming. I was just on the, <clears throat> the, the SAMR acro acronym. Yes. Um, <coughs> what, what do you, from a practical standpoint, substitution, what, what is that? Sure, mean? so it goes in order from, substitution would be like, I can take a worksheet and put it on the computer and it's still a worksheet. Okay, okay so that would be substitution uh, that goes all the way through, like we're redefining the way that we're providing instruction for students so that technology is seamlessly integrated in the work that they're doing. Does that help? It does, what about the other four? Okay, uh, augmentation would be where it is like providing support. So we're supporting the instruction with the technology. Uh, modification is that piece in between where we're supporting it, but we're not quite to the place where we're totally revamping everything that we're doing with that redefinition in mind. I don't have the specific definitions in front no, of me, no, but no, I'd be no. glad to share just, them. Yeah. Just have examples. It's that good, it's the, the linear balance between uh, it's very easy to 
I think whenever we first start with technology, with any teacher, it's easy to say, I have my worksheet and now it's on the computer, look at me using technology, but really is that the thing that is making it a seamless integration? So that ultimate redefinition is where we're hoping to get. Can I follow up on that? I'm just curious, yeah. uh, like particularly in the walkthroughs and when y'all were looking out and gathering what's happening, is there a piece of that that's also looking at maybe more on, on a quantity, on the time on technology? I mean, because I can see, you know, you want to move sure. up the scale to the redefinition, right. but also, I mean, how are we looking at the percentage of time a kid's spending in, in, on a device as opposed to not? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that we have a specific measure for the amount of time that a student is spending on uh, with a technology device. Uh, however, each of our walkthroughs do have a, a narrative section where we can, like, the principal or whomever is doing the walkthrough can designate how the technology is being used and make, sometimes it's by how many students. So it may be that some students are working specifically with the teacher at the teacher table from my elementary lens, while others are working uh, using a technology program for some specific intervention or targeted instruction. So I don't know that we have the quantified, but we do have more information than just a checkbox with SAMR, if that answers your question. Anything else about SAMR before we go on? I'll just yeah. be clear that yeah. the, one of the concerns that I hear from a lot of parents is right that we use too much technology. So right, right that you know it's not well. It's like finding that balance right. point. Right, absolutely. And I also think that you know keyword is integration here, right? So that we should not be using technology for technology's sake. We should be using technology in ways that really enhance instruction and are teaching our students whenever they leave our system ways that technology can be useful and helpful to them as opposed to technology for technology's sake. So that really seamless integration is what we're working toward. So that uh, we hear that concern as well. All right, 6.2 is about creating and implementing a comprehensive instructional technology plan for students at all levels. Uh, we are, we do have technology application TEKS for the 23-24 school year, and what we would like to do with that uh, theme of integration here is find ways that we can teach those TEKS integrated with our other content areas as much as possible so that it's not technology as a standalone. So we're able to make sure all of our students uh, are receiving instruction on how how to use technology appropriately and well, uh, while also using that to supplement their learning. Uh, we're also working to update our district level resources for digital citizenship and creating campus-based plans for K-12 digital citizenship so that each of our students are receiving appropriate instruction to their age and grade. And then finally, providing sufficient instructional technology resources and support. So we can have lots of resources, but if we don't have the support associated with them, then uh, we, we run the risk of them not being utilized um, to their full potential. So uh, this is an important goal that our instructional technology staff of our both uh, our digital learning coordinator and our instructional technology specialist work toward every single day with our teachers. Uh, they have been providing training on these new uh, interactive panels to all of our teachers. So this is where I would give a shout out to Lauren Finkner, who is our instructional technology specialist, who has personally gone to every single campus the week that their smart uh, panels are installed and conducted trainings and worked one-on-one -on -one with teachers and done everything to make sure that teachers are comfortable uh, as comfortable as possible with this new technology that's coming in their classroom. So this is really about providing support for the many resources that we have. Uh, a few highlights here again. Uh, well, I'll start with our new digital learning coordinator. So uh, Natalie Vela, you guys approved her hire back in October. So Natalie's been with us about three weeks now. Uh, she is really working to understand uh, both the resources that we have in place and also our current status as far as technology integration goes so that she can help us look toward what we need to do next steps moving forward. Uh, as part of that, she is collaborating with our content coordinators so that we have that integration of technology into each of our content areas uh, so that it is technology that is uh, really redefining our instruction as opposed to simply uh, substituting for the way that 
perhaps we used to do things before technology. Uh, she and uh, our cor curriculum coordinators are also reviewing resources and how the accessible they are to teachers. This is uh, one of those things where we can have all the resources in the world, but if they're difficult to find or difficult to log into or difficult for students, then we're not fully utilizing them. And so we are continuing to, to do that review so that we can make sure that our resources are really accessible. And then finally, that smart panel installation. We've talked a lot about that tonight already because we're excited that we are almost done with those smart panel installations uh, and our teachers are really uh, able to use those panels Panels, not just as a teacher tool, but as a student tool as well. So in closing, we wanted to share um, some of the feedback from our uh, District Education Improvement Council from, from last week whenever they uh, saw a version of, of the same overview here. Um, one of our teachers said that this has laid the path for the focus around the district and ensuring campuses are working together for a goal. Um, talk about affirmation. Um, but I'll continue and share the other highlights here. Um, all the work we are doing as a campus is directly connected to the district improvement plan, uh, another teacher noted. Um, a third teacher shared, I think the DIP has shaped the work of the district this year with technology and getting campuses up to par with the amount of technology, and I appreciate it. And so from three of the educators in the room, they're really um, seeing how this plays out on their campuses, and really that was representative throughout the survey. I, I just didn't um, read the whole survey to you. Um, we also have other folks uh, on this committee. Uh, a fellow district administrator noted that how, how exciting it was to hear about the different things and the artifacts being gathered from the different campuses and how we are working um, and having evidence of that improvement of our educational programs for our kids. Um, and then a, a community member um, was, was very impressed with how thorough the plan is uh, and multifaceted there. So I um, just wanted to share that with y'all and, and we are happy um, to answer any additional questions that you may have. Question about uh, goal five with uh, buying laptops, which I think is great and needed, are we gonna be able to get to a one-to-one -one ratio? Because if we've got, you know, 24 students in a class and we've only got 21 laptops and then, you know, one or two needs an update or whatever, so I'm just curious if that'll. Right, so right now, in terms of the goal and the way that it's written, it's really designed to just increase that accessibility for our students. We've not set a specific goal in either uh, the strategic plan or the long range technology plan to say we are moving towards being a one to one district. Uh, we definitely want to have greater accessibility and we know we have further to go than just the one to two, uh, but one to one has not been a specific goal for us at this point. I'm glad you guys are getting more devices because I know that there's always, if you got one or two students in the class that doesn't have it, then, then they're left out. So. Yeah. Ultimately, what we want to get to is if a teacher wants to plan a lesson that involves devices for their class, they're able to get that card and implement right. the lesson and not have to juggle that and schedule that out with other teachers and, and struggle to be able to access what they need yeah. for instructional purposes. And that that purpose. cart has enough exactly. for the class, yeah. And then the, the added demand for how many people are on the network. So I'm glad to hear that that's being worked on too. Yes. And this <clears throat> may be kind of a follow-up question of Ms. McAdams and Dr. Payne, but, and, and it's, it's maybe a question about a problem that doesn't exist, but do we have that problem where kids don't have access to technology when they need it? So I think that problem is very much why we see goal five reflected in our strategic plan. And, and just for context, when uh, in spring of 21, we were working through this process, it came up uh, time and time again as we gathered feedback from not only our community, but also our teachers, that access to devices was a real challenge. Uh, part of that was because the last bond that had really supported additional devices had been uh, about six years prior. And so not only had we expended those funds, but the devices that we had purchased with those funds early on after the passage of the bond had started to roll off in terms of their, their lifetime. And so it really was at the forefront uh, of our thinking with our teachers and with our staff uh, due to the timing of that relative to funding. And so we've made great strides already. Uh, and I, I would anticipate that, you know, in the future as we work on that long range purchase plan, uh, we'll definitely want to make sure that not only can we replace the device, 
devices that we now have in place, uh, but also that we can continue uh, to, to make sure that those are accessible, especially as we continue to move towards uh, more online testing. If you'll recall this year, all of our students will be testing online for state assessment as well. But, but I mean, would you say it's a, it's a problem that we, we haven't reached that point? Or, I mean, is there is something else as a board that, that, that you know, we may need to look into or, or do to kind of speed that process along? Or is it is it a goal we're striving for, but it's not a huge issue that is affecting the teachers and the students? I would say that it is less impactful than it was a year ago prior to being able to start uh, purchasing uh, large numbers of additional devices, but, but many would say we, we do need to continue to do more. As I mentioned, we, we've expended about 70% of those funds, and so we're not done uh, just yet, uh, but, but it's always because of uh, the length of time that a device is, is useful, uh, shelf life, if you will, uh, we always have to continue to make sure that we have the capacity to replace uh, and, and to continue to ensure that we have good accessibility so I, I think Josh I think our ratio is improving it's obviously not one-to-one -one and we, far from it and we can continue to work on it with our bond funds I think you I, I think now is access to technology for our teachers a problem uh, I don't think that they can necessarily in all instances access it immediately I think we are at a place where it, they can, but they would. It, it may be a matter of signing up for the cart because there's not enough of them, or working their schedule so they can go to a lab because it may be occupied by other classes. So um, it's accessible, maybe not immediate, and do you have to plan around it because of our ratios? I, I think that's probably where we are from a classroom standpoint. I don't know if that answers your question or not. I, I, I know I can use my wife, for example. They have a lab that a number of them use, so can she just pick up and go down to the lab whenever she feels like it? No, she's got to check to see if the lab's available. So, uh, so I think it's more right now we're at a place of of uh, they're available, but it's a scheduling mechanism too. In some instances, it may be a little bit better in some places than others. I mean, it, it, it takes a little bit of work, but it's, it's not stopping us from moving forward on that goal at this point. I wouldn't think it's stopping us. I think it's just that we can improve upon it. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what I'm asking. As, as the same thing, married to an educator, if you get the cart, it's gotta have enough laptops and then they all have to be working. So. It's not a big deal if it's one or two, but then it is one or two students that doesn't have that. So yeah, that's, I, I don't think it's detrimental, but it is a hiccup. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. And I would say too, if you'll recall in that specific result 5.2, as we work towards that multi-year purchase plan, I think we'll be able to provide much more information to you all as a board in terms of those identified needs and, and how we might be able to meet those in the future. Uh, and I'll just add, I guess, one other piece of information that, um, because I do think it's an important question. When part of the question is, do we want to go to a one-to-one -one as a district? Is it, you know, what are the pros and cons? Obviously, this money is probably the biggest con. Um, we This came up in Education Foundation that one, some, over the last couple of years, one of the grants was to f fund basically an experiment in a couple of classrooms for one-to-one -one devices. And I can't remember how many classrooms it was, but it was, I mean, it's significant. It's like eight or, or so classrooms that are actually have one-to-one -one devices. And, you know, you, so using that and working to see, I think the goal is to see actually data and results from that experiment so I don't know if you know the education more. the education foundation will they buy devices because I believe they will not correct they it was a program that they helped supplement yes to have one-to-one -one in these to study it but did they buy devices I think they funded some of the devices too if I'm correct yeah no. right not all I, of the I devices would just be curious. Some but they of were them able to, to supplement yes. along with the teacher training component because uh, like Stormy discussed in goal six you we can divide by all of the devices in the world but unless we're using them meaningfully they're really uh, not going to to be uh, the most bang for the buck as they could be yeah I agree that was a good piece of it as well that it was included the instructional training with it. I mean, it would be, I will be interested to see the results of that when, you know, however long it takes to kind of get that feedback. 
Anything else? Thank y'all for the report. That helps us understand where we're headed after being on that committee, so I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank yeah. you for continuing to yeah. work on it and give us updates Implement on it, it. as well. Part. Yep, exactly, do the hard work. All right, if there's no other questions, we will adjourn the workshop. Thank <laughs> you.